um, just after ha having met him suddenly in America. You know, he was uh, he was Croatian actually, and um, and he'd worked on so many movies, and he was one of those people that just stood there and did it. Um, and you know, there's it's it takes a particular sort of character to do that sort of stuff. But he never measured anything, and there's very few people in in that that can actually do that. Mm. And he slept at night as well. <laughs> and he was a lovely guy, and he owned a higher a camera high rental house. And uh, Zoran Veselic, his name was, and uh, you'll see his name pop up on a lot of uh, projects. Last thing I remember him doing was the Wolf, uh, not Wolf on Wall Street. He did Wolf on Wall Street, but he also did um, what was the one with Michael Douglas? They made a sequel to it. Um, what was that called? Something, something money, wasn't it? Um, and it was a lot of handheld. The camera was never standing still, and there was never a frame that was not sharp. It was quite, I thought, quite incredible. Mm. And he never bothered. It never seemed to get to him. You know, and maybe maybe he went home and went. Ah! <laughs> but, exactly inside, he was crying. <laughs> yes, yes. Went home and <laughs> cat around the room. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and start the webinar. Welcome, everybody, uh, to this live ACO Q&A. Um, my name is Ed Wright. I'll be hosting this evening. It's a pleasure. And uh, we're talking filming on film, so where we're going to be discussing the merits and differences of utilising film medium. I'm going to go ahead and introduce everyone. Uh, so we have Mike Watson, from, uh, who's the operational manager at Take Two Films, film digital rental house based in West London. We have Adrian Bull, uh, who is the Managing Director of Cine Labs London, Motion Picture Film Laboratory, processing all current film formats and providing dailies, scanning and grading post-production services. We have Phil Mayhew, VSC, Director of Photography, uh, uh, whose selected credits include Casino Royale, The Mask of Zorro and GoldenEye. Uh, we have Crystal Ross, VSC, Director of Photography, uh, whose later credits include Cats, Hard Sun, and uh, Black Sea. And we have Peter Robertson, ACO, camera operator. Hi, everyone. And uh, I have a selected credits here, Atonement, Bohemian Rhapsody, and Edge of T Tomorrow. Uh, we also have Lee Gold, GBCT, First AC, whose uh, selected credits include Casino Royale, Dumbo, Avengers, Age of Ultron. Uh, have I got everyone? Yes, I've done everyone. Excellent. Um, anyone wants to ask a question um, please do so put your uh, questions in the tab below in the Q&A tab and we'll get them to the panel when we can and um, let's get into it um, I wanted to ask you Mike if I could start with you possibly um, for those who maybe maybe their their heads on a rock they don't know who take two is can you tell us a bit about take two and also um, uh, what you guys have been doing during the lockdown how's it affected take two oh Pretty bad. I'm sure everyone's in the same boat. Um, you broke up a bit there, but I think you just said how it affected too uh, during lockdown. Um, there's, there's the work's been very quiet, very quiet indeed. Uh, but the one thing that has been surprising is we're doing almost an equal amount of film, 16 mil film jobs, as we would do digital, um, which is much higher than normal. And I think that's because possibly. I think we're struggling to hear you here, uh, Mike. I wonder if we could um, lean you in a bit more, maybe. Yeah? A little bit. There's yeah. try again. Yeah. So I think uh, during lockdown... I think there's an issue with his sound system, I'm afraid. I think it's... Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, get me closer, I'll be the whole screen. Can you hear me now? Oh, you've got a you've got uh, as well there a little bit, unfortunately. Yeah, try try again, Mike. Sorry. Sorry, um, it's not working over here for some reason. Um, so yeah, during lockdown, uh, still managed. Sixteen mil. No, it's not. It's no good. We're, we're struggling, Mike. Sorry. Um, I wonder if um, if I make a suggestion, maybe we we can get a um, one of those earpods or uh, have you got any of those? Connectable uh, headphones. We could try that. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Well, we'll, we'll pause and we'll come back to you. Sorry about that. Um, 
this is why we do technical tests beforehand mm. and um, not just talk about other stuff, uh, which we did. So anyway, um, if I could bring you, Adrian, into this uh, briefly. Um, Sydney Labs, all the big productions stop work, uh, stop production. So how on earth did you guys carry on during this really tricky time of COVID-19? Um, so it's quite, I mean, we, you know, we were aware that there was this big, big freight train coming towards us sort of early in March. Um, we had a few productions that were, were in prep that were just about to go. And, you know, I'm sure lots of people were, were expecting to be working on them as well. Um, we'd had camera tests coming in from location for, for the next Mission Impossible film back in March. And I guess they were in Venice at the time. Um, all of a sudden it kicked off in Italy and that, that started to shut down quite quickly. Um, we were aware that, you know, within a few weeks we were expecting everything to shut down. Um, but we'd actually had someone within lab test positive. Um, uh, he went sick around the 10th of March, Paul, our uh, senior colorist. And we, you know, we sort of reacted to that quite quickly in terms of getting everybody out of the lab and, you know, really not knowing at that stage how serious it was and how, how contagious it was and how much people were going to be affected. Um, so we'd sort of created our own lockdown within the lab before, before Boris enforced it. Or, or suggested that it might be an idea to try and fix it. Um, we made a sort of difficult decision to, to actually keep the lab open. Um, it was, you know, in terms of the, the mechanical aspect of the lab, in terms of the film process and all the bearings, all the chemistry, all that sort of stuff, um, you know, it's horrible shutting it down over Christmas time and having a sort of period of, a, of five days to a 10 day period where you kind of shut down with, with very little happening because you typically come back to all manner of sort of issues in terms of getting the bath up and running and, and um, seasoned and, and getting it back up to performance. So what we did was shut down the night shift, um, kept a day shift on and basically, you know, continued to, to process. Um, amazingly, I don't think there's been a day gone by since that lockdown started where we haven't processed film. And, you know, on some days it's clearly been very light and it's maybe only been a thousand or two thousand feet of film. Um, but probably from Easter onwards, we started to see a steady return and increase on film coming in. And a lot of it was small format. A lot of it was Super 8 and 16 mil that people were going out shooting, you know, self-shooting on, on projects that they could get away with sort of stealth light, you know, uh, under the lockdown situation. And then realistically through... May it started to pick up, continued to pick up. June was actually really quite surprising how busy it was. We processed just under 100,000 feet of film in June. And bear in mind, that was no long, long form productions at all. That's all short form jobs, commercials, promos, um, you know, people doing personal projects, you know, where they've got, you know, three or four rolls of 16 mil sat in the fridge and they finally dragged it out and thought, I'll go and shoot something with it. Um, and then, I haven't quite got the figures yet for July, but about the 17th of July, we were up to about 130, 140,000 feet. So I think we'll double already in July what we processed in June. Um, to put it into perspective, our peak months last year were just under a million feet. So it's a fraction of what, you know, what we'd really like to be doing at this busy part of the year. Um, but I think what was, you know, what proved itself was the, the fact that people wanted to shoot film, people wanted to carry on and, and shoot film. And in some respects, you know, the feedback that we were getting from some cinematographers was that it was just easy to go and grab the 16 mil, uh, you know, 416 or an SR2 or a Bolex that's, you know, sat on the mantelpiece and go and shoot something and not needing an entourage of people around them to support it. So it was, it was sort of capitalizing on that. And, and the main thing was making sure people knew that we were open because, I'd say 90% of the inquiries came, coming through was, you know, saying as a start off, I'm assuming you're closed at the moment, but when do you think you might be opening because we're shooting something that we want to send into the lab? So, um, you know, most people were surprised when we were saying send it in. What we did do, which is still sort of happening, is we sort of had an enforced three-day quarantine for, for physical stuff coming into the lab. Um, you know, not knowing exactly what the circumstances were around you know, the, the surface um, spread of the virus, the easiest thing to do was just have a have a box for each day of the week, 
basically everything that got delivered on that day went into the box three days later with touch it for processing um we've refined that a little bit now so for the productions that are shooting daily already uh there's a there's a bypass way around that in terms of the safety precautions but what that also did was help us plan and schedule the work a little little bit better bearing in mind we had a significantly reduced staffing complement through that period it looks like uh we're managing to get mike up and running i think um, so we've got two mics i've just been <laughs> you have two mics um oh. so i'm going to turn one off yeah there we go wow okay mike in 3d <coughs> Okay, can you still see me and now hear me? That, that is so so clear and crystal clear. Fantastic. Okay. Well there we go. Um, That's why he's operations manager. At yeah, right. No, I couldn't <laughs> find any headphones with the old jack because they're all the new Apple ones. So, cool. yeah, sorry. No worries, Mike. Thanks for sorting that out. Um, yeah, it's, question bounce back to you, that, that original one. Uh, how's Take Two been in, in during the COVID-19 era? It's been really tough. I mean, it really has. Um, there, there hasn't been a lot of work. Uh, it's starting to come back and it looks like next month there's a lot of things that hopefully are going to kick off. Um, and it does look busy thereafter. Uh, so we're just riding up to that point. Uh, but the thing that has been interesting, which is what I was trying to say so much, was uh, they seem to be doing quite a bit of 16 mil film work during, during the lockdown versus the normal ratio of that compared to, you know, digital. And, um, and I think that's because it's a smaller crew. And it's easier and you don't need, you know, bits and, you know, video village and all that sort of stuff. So actually, it's during this time something people are able to, to utilize. And also, uh, with having more people and crew, it makes the things more expensive uh, and slower. Uh, so that slight imbalance with the, you know, the film stock costs and the developing is possibly weighing itself as well, you know, more equal. Have I gone? <laughs> No, we've just um, taken one of your videos away just so it's, it looks like it's okay. very technical what we're doing. We've got people behind the scenes. Um, so, so it's yeah, so interesting, interesting dynamic that's, that seems to have happened. Yeah, so there's, there seems to be a little shift, um, which is it's interesting. So, yeah, I seem to be prepping an awful lot of 16 mil because most of the young guys don't know how to do it for. <laughs> that's my day. But there we go. Fantastic. Um, yeah. I'm going to throw it over to you, Phil. So, when you started, there was only film. That was the only medium to start with. So, if anything, the the uh, the digital era, there was a bit of a an adaption of uh, you got to you got to move into those times a little bit. But um, your experience of film, obviously, there's a lot to talk about there. But um, yeah, d just just paint a little picture for us. Well, if you're shooting on film, I, I, when I started, it was all black and white, thirty five millimeter. Um, and then when colour television came along, um, it, a lot of 16 millimetre was being used because 35 mil colour was expensive. Um, but there was no other way of uh, capturing imagery. There was film was it. And uh, the, the, the tragedy now, if I can call it that, with digital is that we, in those days, the cameraman was the magician. And what he, no one knew what he was doing until the next day when they saw it all and everybody would gather to see it. Now with digital, it seems that it's all, at the end of the day, no one seems interested in what you've done because you've had the video assist there and all the rest of it. We worked without video assist. We worked without any of those things. And we had to know what we were doing um, all the time we were doing it. And the film, when I started uh, color film, I did a lot of work on 60 millimeter color film and it was 50 ASA. And nowadays the, the average camera, I think is about 800. ASA, if not more. Uh, so 50, you've got to know what you're doing and you've got to be aware of uh, contrast, exposure, what happens in the darker points of the set, what happens in the lighter points of the set, and so on and so on. So you had to be more aware of, your, uh, of the business of photography. And I feel that nowadays, to a certain extent, uh, photography is getting lost uh, because the digital camera can record more or less what's in front of it and present it as an almost finished picture. I know you can have you know, DIs and fiddle with it and all the rest of it, 
but in the beginning, you know, when, when you murdered on a film set in the beginning, if the, if the set was black, there was nothing on the film and you, you had to put a lot of light in to actually make it work. And you had to know how to put that light in and how to use it and how to make the film match in terms of scene by scene by scene by scene. Am I drooling on here? But I mean, I, that's a sort of, uh, you know, how we started, how I started. And when digital came around, I mean, camcorders have been around since the, I don't know, the late eighties and middle eighties. Um, and it became, it suddenly became, uh, people said, why can't we do this in film? Why can't we do, make films using this sort of equipment? But it seemed to me that uh, in the beginning, um, no one had really taken on board the, uh, I don't want to use the word artistry, but no one had taken on board the, uh, the, the technique of photography and how to capture that digitally. Um, and now they're doing it. And that Avriflex, I mean, it's come along a lot, hell of a long way from the first three or four cameras they had. Um, and now that's become the go-to medium, camera 65 and all of that stuff. And, and it's looking terrific. And it's actually, you know, really good. And uh, I find it quite exciting now that you can, um, you can still, you can shoot with a lot less light. But what I find is troubling me is that people, because of it's digital and it's continuous, there is no discipline in the way it's handled, the way the camera is set up and the way the takes are structured and the way the actors work. Um, it's, a, it's, it's become very free moving. And I think that's a lot to do with uh, reality TV as well, which has taken off. Um, people see that every night on their televisions and uh, we're sort of losing the techniques of lighting sets and lighting people's faces. Um, um, I'm going off into all sorts of tangents. Ask me another question. Uh, it's all good. Uh, there's, there's lots of interesting points to, to pick up on there. And I wonder if, if Chris, you had a steer on, on a few of those. But I wanted to ask you, Chris, you had an interesting way in. Um, yeah, and I understand there's a relationship between yourself and Mike there um, in terms of when you started out. But also, you did you started in film, didn't you? And, and then transitioned to digital. Oh, you're, you're oh, muted. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, I, my first... Uh, like film handling job as Mike will attest to uh, was picking <laughs> picking up boxes uh, of thousand foot low uh, thousand foot reels and running them up a flight of stairs at GP film services and loading them into the fridge <laughs> at, at the film game. I, I probably probably handled more film than the, than the most people as I was the the active one that that um that got that said yes when he was told what to do um and then. Yeah, then I went to Panavision and I worked there for a long time and fixing film cameras and, you know, uh, looking after um, the likes of uh, Mr. Gold below me on the, on the screen. Um, and then, yeah, and when I first began, there was obviously uh, a form of, uh, you know, DigiBeta existing, all that sort of stuff. But, but if you wanted to be a serious filmmaker, then if you were making shorts, it was still, you know, uh, you know, if you were lucky to to, to grab a movie cam compact or a, or a Panaflex, then that was great. Or or if you were, you know, if you were unlucky, you you would make do with an SR three or an SR two or whatever, and, and, and shoot your short film on sixteen mil. And that was that was like the beginning. You know, the the Digivita option wasn't really an option if you wanted to, you know, uh, have some. If you wanted to launch yourself, basically, in in you know, in the early in the early noughties when I was when I was doing it. Um, but sadly, but I feel like a, a little bit of a fraud because I haven't shot on film for, you know, for, for quite some time. I think 2013 was the last time I shot an actual project on it. And I, I test it a huge amount. You know, I run, we ran, you know, 20,000 feet of film on tests to, for Trust, um, a, a TV show that I did with, with Danny, um, with Danny Boyle. But, um, but we couldn't, we couldn't quite, justify the i guess the 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 various the various costs that are stacked against it but actually in the grand scheme of things those costs are are, are sadly kind of negligible compared to the rest of the cost of shooting a film uh, or a tv series and and when you you know when you talk about you know trying to produce you know producing three hours worth of rushes per day on a digital system and running a lab for 24 hours to process and transcode and you know hard drives being flown around the world and all that sort of stuff you you quickly realize that the economics 
are weighted against both, you know, shooting films is expensive, shooting TV shows is expensive, and you're either going to, you know, spend money in one direction or spend money in the other. So, um, yeah, I do miss, I do miss celluloid, but I do think, um, I do think that the, the new technology, the elect, the, well, the red one to start off with, and then the, and then the Alexa and all the cameras that have come since have kind of freed up the camera and cinematography in a way. I think a lot of, a lot of technology invention of the last decade has been due to the high ASA of the, of the camera systems. Um, and I think a lot of the camera operating technology that has been invented in the last 10 years has kind of freed up the camera. You know, I, I see, I see in, you know, reasonably small budgeted TV shows, the sort of camera operating that you would have, that would have been exclusive to a feature film, you know, 20 years ago, you know, the long, the long takes or elegant steady cam, you know, gimbal work, that kind of thing. Um, I think I think digital acquisition has definitely helped in that regard. Yeah. Um, actually, bring you into this, Pete. And um, I asked you about a number of weeks ago when we did the, the panel. Actually, the previous panel, we talked about the atonement shot, didn't we? And we said, well, how would it have been different if it was shot now? And that's actually interesting to pick up on that point from Christopher. Is if it was, it'd be it was, on the on the Alexa oh, sixty five, and you'd be on your knees, Pete. It, it would have been about 25 minutes <laughs> long. The whole film would have been shot in one take if it had been on digital. Yeah. <laughs> now, that, that's the thing with film. Um, you know, thank God for 400-foot magazines because they used to get a rest when they, they changed the magazine. You know, um, now they just say, just keep running, keep running. You know, and, you know, you end up as the human tripod. Um, quite often. So in that sense, the, there has been a kind of a discipline change. But definitely, I mean, I agree with what Chris says now that the, you know, that atonement shot, we may have done that on a gimbal, you know, that might have made it easier to do. But, um, you know, uh, we shot it on film with a 500 foot magazine. And, um, you know, with... Um, three motors and two video assists uh, you know it was a huge weight but I mean now I'd have just probably done it on a gimbal given it to the grips and I would have just sat there on the wheels quite happily telling them turn left take pan you know track in track out go further right jib up you know so he, the, the discipline has, has changed, definitely, in that sense. And, you know, the technology's forced that as much as anything else. But, um, I mean, what, one thing I, I wanted to say about film versus digital for me as an operator, what you don't get now is um, we used to get rushes every day that we'd go and see collectively as a camera crew. And it was a wonderful sort of um, quality control experience because we saw what we'd shot projected on usually on the scale that it was going to be seen in the cinema. Now, the only time I get to see my rushes usually is at the cast and crew screening. And that's the first time that I'll see them projected out on the full you know, scale. So it's almost impossible to pick up to, you know, the rushes, seeing rushes was a learning process. You could see little, you know, flaws in your operating and focus flaws or, you know, um, that you would correct the next day, you know. So it was a, a sort of a progressive thing. But now you, I, I sometimes go and see stuff at the cinema that I've shot and I thought, oh, no, they used that shot, you know we marked that down as no good, you know, and it got used. So, I, I, yeah, I think, you know, there's some things that have worked well going over to digital and some things we've lost, you know, hopefully not forever, but, you know. Lee, if I could bring you in on that uh, subject, actually. Um, obviously, you've worked in, in both mediums yourself over the years. And um, do, you, do you agree with what, what Peter's saying about some of the discipline factors from your uh, point of yeah, view? Yeah, no, I totally agree with Peter about that. Um, I mean, I miss the, 
like checking the game. It was always a moment at the end of a, you know, doing a, a steam. You check the gate and there'd be a moment where everyone just wait patiently for you to say, yeah, good gate. I mean, now it just sort of just seems to be the first, just goes straight into another uh, setup and, and no one's waiting. I haven't even had a chance to play the last clip. I mean, we're already moving everything to the next position, yeah. Um, I mean, it's difficult. The, um, on, on film, I, I just remember having just more time and, you know, taking the tape measure out. Now I don't even get a chance to take the tape measure out. You're actually just cracking the shot off, maybe a bit of peaking. I mean, I hate it doing off the monitor, but you end up doing it off the uh, monitor because you have, you've got no time. Everything's quite quick and the process is quite quick. Uh, you're kind of rushed into it. And in terms of obviously a huge part of your job is the technical management of, of all the bits and bobs, all the equipment. I mean, is that, is that different in, in, in the digital world versus film? Or is, do you run it exactly the same way? No, you, you run it pretty much the same. Yeah. I mean, the difference is, you, you know, your mags are changing every, if you're on 400 foot every four minutes, 1,000 foot, you know, 10 minutes. So you've got time for a little breather there. Whereas, you know, a five, 12 gigabyte could last you 30 minutes on the high rip, you know. So you don't feel the, the pressure, that, that real uh, pressure of the, of, you know, not, not the messing up the film itself versus the, um, versus sort of pixels that, yeah, not so much of a uh, worry. I'm waiting for the rushes the next day. I mean, at least you know you've got it when you've got it. Yeah, that's true. I remember doing stuff with Phil and waiting for that rushes report. You know, you know you're just hoping overnight. Oh, I hope it's all right. Is that a collective thing between the whole camera crew? Do you, are, you, are you all thinking that as well, or is it is it way worse for the folks below? Uh, well, I think we all yes. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. if you're as the cameraman or the sorry the cinematographer, you are maybe you may be trying something. And you're looking at it with your eyes, and if it's on film, you know you don't necessarily know if it's exactly going to come out like that on the film. Uh, obviously, with experience, you get to know certain things will go. You build in uh, breathers. Uh, if you want to shoot something very dark, then you obviously you open the camera up, and knowing that you can darken it later, and you do things like that. Um, but. As I say in the beginning, it, it's it's what I forgot to tell you all, by the way, was that I started out as an amateur shooting 16 millimeter black and white and uh, as well as stills. A lot of people shot stills, processed my own stills and all the rest of it. So I got used to how the, the emotion, emulsion worked and what I could do with it, what I couldn't do with it. And certainly making those amateur films, which is well before I got into the business, uh, I learned a lot about camera operating, exposure, quality of lenses, uh, depth of field, all that sort of thing, um, which I think is, you know, it's quite important if you're going to shoot on film. Um, have I distracted myself? I probably have. But, um, yeah, what was I saying, Ed? No, it's, 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 all, it's all good stuff. Uh, you know, I was oh, yeah, about the rushes. Yeah, the, the thing is that it, we were magicians in a sense because no one knew what was going on. So everybody had to come into the viewing theatre to see it, as Peter is saying. Uh, now, I, on, uh, I did a digital, my first digital film in 2010, and even on that film at night, it was just me and the director watching a playback of the rushes. Nobody else stayed. Nobody else seemed to be interested. And yet the video is probably not going to show it exactly how it's going to be because um, these were the very early days of it. Um, you know, you had a DIT, but we were all learning in that beginning phrase, you know. And mm -hmm. I, do, I do miss that communal rushes thing where you all sit together and uh, yeah. you, you see how the actor works and you see what he, you know, maybe his best side on his face, how the light affects him the camera's up or down, how it affects him. Um, mm. you, you should grow to learn how people look. And of course, you've got video assist to do it, but I don't think it's quite the same. As Lee says, it's all a bit rushed now. You know, it's, uh, we all look at the monitor and say, yeah, that's okay, move on, you know, rather than actually assess it. You know, if you're talking about a, an oil painter, he'll paint something and he may stand back and just look and see if he likes it. We don't get that anymore. We don't get that... Uh, uh, amount of time to actually see if we like it or not it's our, are you ready? can we shoot now you know 
the Russia's uh, Phil was an opportunity for, as you say, it's like a team talk. You could literally review what you were doing, you know, and discuss it as a team. If the cinematographer didn't like, you know, the angle at which they were photographing a particular artist or the height of the camera, or it, that was the opportunity to discuss it yeah. and change it. Yeah. Um, whereas now we just hurtle along yeah. and, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to have those collective talks. Uh, I think everyone's working more, uh, you know, head down in their own little um, little space, you know, their little job. And um, yeah, I, cer I certainly miss those those times. Yeah. 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 On my on my first film, we um, we it was 16 mil. It was very low budget. We was 16 mil. And our, our communal rushes uh, were, so we would get a mini DV tape back from, uh, from tech and, uh, and play it on a little combi unit. And the, the, myself, the production designer, the folks pulling on the director, we'd all huddle around this little seven inch screen. Um, and and the, even though we now have pics and all that sort of stuff, it was really, it was the communal thing that really made us learn the lessons. Yeah, we had 19 days to shoot the film and we made, you know, and we made a change of some description after every day's worth of rushes to, you know, to refine what we were doing and, and you know, trying to make it, make the film a, a better storytelling experience. Uh, you know, I've, and it's amazing, you know, you do, you shoot a TV series now, you know, like Trust was a hundred and, for me, was 125 shoot days, uh, uh, at which point there were no, there was no, not a single opportunity for a like self-referential discussion about you know how are things going Ooh, on yeah. day fifty-five. What do you think we're going to do for the next sixty days? Um, it's just like yeah, let's new set, new location, turn the lights on, let's go, turn over. Um, it's amazing so, yeah. to me that that the production and the producers because what we're doing with, with rushes used to be like quality control. So so you have this massive investment in a production, but nobody's looking now mm. at what's going down on, on, on film or on digital. And you think, well, don't you want to check your investment? <laughs> you know, um, and oh, it'll be fine. Don't worry, move on to the next, next day. Oh, no. I, I find well, I, directors now are directing from a tent. They're inside a blacked mm. out tent. You don't see them. I think mm. another issue, I think, with the, with, I mean, DI was a great invention, but the other issue now is that uh, so many things can be saved, <laughs> if that's the right expression. Uh, if it's not quite what you want, you can usually save it with using digital intermedia. Um, whereas on film, you only had a certain limitation. You could be make it brighter or darker, or you could make it greener or pinker, but you couldn't do much else with it. Uh, whereas DI now, you can do so much. You can, mm. in the old days, if you shot a thin negative because you wanted a nice dark uh, film noir effect, if the negative was too thin, it didn't uh, print well and it would scratch very often going through the machine. So they always asked you to keep the level of emotion up so that it wouldn't scratch going through the machine. So all that had to be taken into account. Now you can shoot, you know, very, very low light levels. As long as you can see it, you can probably make something out of it. In, interesting point. I don't know how many have, I don't know how many of you have been on any shoots over the last couple of months or primarily probably the last month since the sort of lockdown relaxed. But I was on, um, I was on a commercial shoot on location the week before last. And it was sort of, you know, the first, first experience of seeing the new way of working with all of the, you know, with all of the, social distancing and masks and all of that stuff. And what was interesting was the feedback, you know, they were shooting with five cameras, five film cameras on that, on that shoot. But the feedback was that actually all of the social distancing measures and the precautions, you know, it actually worked quite well with the pace of film. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that people were waiting because of that aspect of it. You know, they were waiting for the loaders and they were waiting for mags and they knew that they were shooting 400 foot, so they only had 10 or 11 minute loads on 16 mil. Um, whereas on the digital stuff, it feels like the COVID um, measures are having an impact on the rate at which people are shooting. And, you know, that's inevitably the difference in the, you know, the shooting ratio aspect of film. You know, when we're talking about the cost of shooting on film, it all comes down to shooting ratio. 
So if it's a you know, three camera shoot, digital, and they're going to all shoot three or four hours worth of material each per day, you're not going to stand a chance of doing that on, on film for any reasonable budget. But if it's a two camera shoot and you're shooting an hour and a half a day, then it probably stacks up quite well against, you know, against the two camera Alexa, Alexa shoot, if, you know, if you're controlling the shooting ratio. Um, but, you know, I don't know whether anyone's witnessed that yeah, whether anyone's felt the experience of the of the difficulty of managing with with uh, the COVID measures on on shoots, whether it's digital or film. I, I think that, I think also that the um, the people practiced. You know, they rehearsed. Everyone rehearsed. The whole it was the actors, the crew. Everyone knew what they had to do, um, and so there was more teamwork, and it just went smoother. I mean, Doc Martin shoots every other year um you know on film and from what i hear it's an easy set it 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 runs very smoothly it's not chaotic it's not whatever and it's solely done on film um mm -hmm. for other reasons as well i'm sure because it's probably more uh neutral to the actors and actresses um you know and kind to them uh and the harsh conditions down there as well with the sun reflecting off the sea and so on but it works really well if there's a team that that has done it before and everyone knows their place and everyone works together where I think that a lot of that is lost now on the digital side. Um, it's just frantic, go, 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 the, the shoot the rehearsal, just keep, oh yeah, that's great, move on. Mm -hmm. and, oh, we'll try it a different way. They didn't think about it before they actually go and do it. Um, so I, that's the take I hear from a lot of people who come in. I think um, also as well, Mike, the ergonomics of shooting on film, um, you know, you don't have the you can slim it right down. You don't have the black tents. You don't have lots of cabling. Um, okay. You know, if, if you want to turn everything around, you okay, we're shooting this way. You don't have to clear everything out of the way. It is possible if you, you know, something like Doc Martin that is light dependent a lot of the time outside in the weather. You don't want to be moving huge amounts of kit, um, you know, if, if you're chasing the end of the day to get a few shots in. So you can move a lot quicker um, with film, um, you know, that, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. But it is lost. <laughs> I see a lot of crews coming in who, who want to use digital now. And I spend a lot of time in the test rooms, just not the basics, but telling them, so you've just got to think about it from this point of view. And it's a whole new side they've never seen. And I actually think it makes them better as well. I think, they, I think people who've come from the film background and pick up the digital can do a, probably a better job um, because they still have some of those disciplines which can transfer over, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a sad thing that it's not um, as popular as it, as it could be. I also think that film is, I mean, it, this is gonna be maybe too technical, but uh, you know, it, it's got a fitness to it. And uh, obviously when the focus is in the film, there are bits that it is sharp in and bits it is soft in. So at the same time on 35 mil, you have a sharp picture somewhere and softer pictures before and after that sharp picture, which gives it a nice roundedness. So if it's, I don't know, 35 mil and you put it on telly, it still looks rounded and soft, but the detail's there. But if you blow it up, there's still that sharp image in it. It doesn't fall apart. Whereas with digital, uh, if you do 2K or 4K, it looks great on telly. If you do 8K, it looks too sharp right, um, on an 8K telly, you know, at home, and it looks a bit false, a bit PlayStation-y. You take the 8K and you go to the cinema, then it, and it's huge screen, then it's like, oh, that's working. That, that, that now fits, and it smooths off a little. But film, like 35 mil, will just fit both without any problems. If you don't need to think about the end result and shoot accordingly with, with the digital camera, which I suppose you can always shoot at 8K and then just down res it anyway um, for the different formats. Uh, but yeah, from that point of view, films are a start as well. Anyway. Yeah. We are yeah, yeah. lamenting some of. Oh, sorry, uh, Chris. I oh, know. I was just going to say, yeah. There's the, the you know the beautiful softness to a, a roll of 200T color negative. You know, um, when when we did the tests for for trust, we we uh, I took a I took a five three a five three five from from Technovision and a, a set of super speeds. Uh, and Francesco, the focus puller, and a set of sticks, and myself and Danny, and we just wandered around the streets of Rome shooting uh, uh, the first AD as a stand-in. And we were 
yeah, unencumbered by tourists. There were, you know, nobody spotted us. It was just like the tiniest little unit and it was really, really easy. Um, and then when we came back to shoot the actual show, um, and then we obviously we had two cameras, but we had DIT tent, you know, like a massive, massive Chutney village. Um, and we had to shut down all the squares because we were, and put, you know, the irony, shut down the squares and then put extras in to replace the tourists because we just couldn't, we couldn't operate. We were so visible. Um, and I kind of missed that. I missed that, you know, a 16 mil kit, you know, a set of, a set of five super speeds in a box, uh, you know, a camera with a mag on and two mags in a box and a changing tent. You know, two of you could literally take an entire kit to shoot a movie. Whereas now it's like, it's like, where's my, where's my 17 tonner? Um, Cause I, yeah. And um, I mean, um, we are, we are sort of um, bashing on about uh, how we miss film, but actually film, there is still there is still a lot of stuff being shown in film, right? So, um, mm. I mean, Adrian, I, I was just going to say to you, I don't think people really realise how close we came to to losing film when when Kodak, for example, filed for bankruptcy, didn't it? Yeah. So, you know, just a very very brief bit of the background of, of CineLab. I was um, I was CTO of, of Ascent up until two thousand and ten when we we sold to Deluxe and then transferred across to Deluxe and was with them until. Uh, 2013, when I actually set up CineLab, but on the inside of it, it was really quite obvious what was happening with both the film aspect of of the operations for both Technicolor and Deluxe, and I'd been previously at Technicolor as well. So you have a pretty good insight. We're we're sort of all involved in the creative front end side of of making films, and we don't really realise how significant the distribution piece was. So. You know, historically, the 100 years of, of Technicolor and Deluxe was really very, very much uh, underpinned by the fact that they were making literally thousands of prints for every film that were going out to the cinemas worldwide. So even for the last Potters back in 2009 and 10, that you know, they were making 20,000 prints for distribution. That was $20 million worth of revenue. So what happened around the film side of things was you know, that peak period, which I think was 2010 in terms of Kodak numbers, they had sold something like 1.8, it was, sorry, 18 billion feet of print film was sold in 2010. That translated to roughly $1.8 billion worth of revenue for both primarily to Deluxe and Technicolor because they owned about 85% of the market. And within a three-year period, that fell off a cliff. I mean, literally, digital cinema just wiped it out in, in that three-year period. And I was in Deluxe at the time when they were forecasting a 25% reduction year-on-year on, year on lab revenues. And that period from 2011 to 2012, I think it actually dropped by 65%. So that is just one phenomenal uh, economic challenge for the businesses. So, so when we... You know, it was no surprise that 2012 and end of 2012, Kodak went into Chapter 11. And the bizarre thing was, you know, I acquired with my business partner, we acquired Bucks Laboratories in 2013 um, with the plan to turn it around to support front end, recognising that a small niche lab that purely did front end could probably survive with the residual work that was there. Whereas if you looked at Deluxe in Denham, which had a 10 acre site, that at its peak had a thousand people working out of it. By 2012, it had 30 people in that site to support the front end stuff that was going through. Well, the numbers never were going to stack up on that. That was just, you know, it was less than 5% of the revenue that they previously had to support the front end work. So it was no surprise that in such a short period of time, Deluxe and Technicolor switched and, and just shut down those labs because they couldn't support the scale of those operations. Um, you know, going back to the Technicolor thing, you know, people thought we were mad setting up a lab in 2013 at the point when Kodak genuinely were in chapter 11 at the point when we when we established CineLab. Thankfully, they came out of chapter 11, I think around October that year, it was short, shortly afterwards. Um, but, you know, our belief was that it was a relatively short term window for people continuing to shoot film and that it might only be a two or three year term. But actually, the, the value of establishing and continuing the lab was really around the archive business that longer term would be there. You know, there was 100 years worth of film heritage and history 
and all of that film that was shot 50 years ago or 60 years ago still inherently had locked in it resolution at 4K and high dynamic range, which was the reason why, you know, for 30, 40 years, we've remastered those same film negatives time and time again for standard def, for standard def widescreen, for standard def digital, then moving to HD, now 2K, now 4K <laughs> HDR. Um, so, you know, it was, again, one of the things I, I sort of say in the story about it was we established at the low point, you know, it could, it could have got worse, it could have stopped completely. But from our perspective, it, you know, it, the challenge was we can only increase the amount of work we're doing from here because it was so, so minimal. So that first full year, we processed just over half a million feet of film. Um, in 2019, we did just under six million feet of film. So, you know, it's a, a pretty phenomenal uh, increase. Difficult to say that genuinely the film markets increased in that overall volume, but what we've inevitably done is taken more of the market share. And actually there's a lot of work that we do that's international, that's shot around Europe, that's shot in, in, you know, in Africa and Asia that's coming into London for us to process, you know, obviously typically, typically with flights and everything, we're close to Heathrow. So um, can benefit in terms of, of being able to get content into us quickly. Um, but, you know, the encouraging thing through that period is actually watching the millennials and guys that have studied purely in a digital world see film as the sort of holy grail and the, and the thing that they want to get you know, they want to shoot a production on film. And, you know, for Phil, who's had his whole career on film, you know, to some extent, whether you shoot another film or not, probably doesn't really matter to you. But for someone at the start of their career, who's only exposed to digital, they look at it and go, well, if I don't shoot film scenes, if I don't get my hands on a film camera soon, <laughs> I might never, ever shoot on film. Well, there's a, there's a very good theory that um, Brian Tofano once was saying to me, uh, was that uh, if you can shoot on film, you can shoot on anything. Because once you understand how film works in terms of light exposure and end product, you can then shoot with any other device you want. Because you have a, you know, you have a built-in way of dealing with things in layers. So. You, have, yeah. you, have to learn, you have to learn it. You can't just see it. No, no, no. no. no that's exactly right. And to follow on from what Adrian was saying, um, and well, he's the expert, not me, but uh, it was my understanding that the front end in the days of film, the front end was almost given away for free so that you could get the printing at the back end. And that's how the money was made. Yep. And when the printing went with, with digital projection, uh, which was a godsend to some cinemas, I have to say, but um, you know, that actually wrecked the lab work really, because you know, they may, they may do, uh, I think on GoldenEye, we shot 750,000 feet of negative. But how many prints were made from that? You know, and there, which is much more than the 750,000 feet. Um, and that's where Kodak, uh, I was saying it aired earlier today, Kodak survived mostly on amateur film, uh, amateur cinema, um, uh, stills people, you know, uh, holiday snaps and uh, x-ray material and all of that stuff, the way the film was used in so many different departments. The film industry, I was told, was only 7% of their yearly uh, intake in terms of money because they spent, you know, every time someone went to a concert and a flash went off, uh, I remember I was with a Kodak rep once and he said, that's another dollar in our pocket. He said, that's the flash went off. Um, <laughs> but now that's, you know, a thing of the past, you know. Is it true, Adrian, that, um, it, you know, it is also down to a number of highly sort of influential figures in the film industry, the likes of Chris Nolan, Tom Cruise, have you, who insist, who've championed, you know, the, the use of film, that have kept it up there in the, in, in the you know, the, the possible... Um, you know, uses for cinematographers, directors, you know, uh, that can decide from an aesthetic point of view that, you know, it broadens their palette. You know, it's great to have both digital and film. Um, and they made that point, you know, that um, very high profile films that have used, used yeah. film and refused to let it go. I, th I think it's a fair point. I mean, Kodak in that period, you know, 2012, 2013, it, it was a massive, massive challenge for them to, to, to turn it around. And, and the thing that they did do was go to the studios. You know, the studios typically had um, 
uh, rebate deals in place based on the volume of work that went through in terms of stock that was purchased. And, and primarily, you know, as Phil said again, that was driven largely by the print side of it, the print distribution side of it, rather than the front end. Um, there were typically commitments on minimum spends that existed, and that was the same for Deluxe and Technicolor across their studio agreements. And um, what happened in that period where it, it changed so dramatically was clearly the, the, the demand for the print side of it, it disappeared. So it was, okay, well, you need to spend the money on something, and that's where the, the commitment came from the studios, driven largely by the big, you know, big cinematographers, as you say, Chris Nolan, um, Tarantino, Scorsese, going to the studios, studios and saying, look, make a commitment to Kodak that you'll, you'll have a minimum spend still around front end. And I think, I'm not sure whether it still exists. I mean, it did lapse. It was a, I think it was originally a three or four year term. Um, it lapsed a few years ago, I think, for a couple of the studios, they did sort of renew commitments and, and you know, I don't know the details of what level they were at. Um, but what that did was sort of guarantee for, you know, for some of those bigger guys that Kodak were going to carry on making film and making it available. Um, the bit that, you know, I think is really interesting is just the number of smaller productions that are shooting on film. And it's frustrating when people think that film is only purely the domain of the big 100 million, 200 million dollar feature films, because some of the lowest budget films we've done have shot 35 millimeter on literally less than 200,000 pound budgets. And, and that's included film stock processing and scanning. So, you know, when it's frustrating when we hear about it and, and quite often, you know, it's, it's a lot of the ego side of it where, you know, director or cinematographer will brag about the fact that of course it was more expensive to shoot on film and because they shot on film it was another half a million or another three quarters of a million pounds on the, on the budget but they could justify it and because of the look and I sort of look at it and go well I know that you didn't on everything you spent around film in terms of the stock the processing the scanning and if there's any overhead that you could have considered for the operational additional staff your budget wasn't half a million quid so it couldn't have cost you half a million more than the equivalent and, um, you know, that's the challenge. There's this sort of elitism of, of people saying, well, film's reassuringly expensive and it's our domain and not everybody has access to it and we're special, which unfortunately, you know, I think puts people off. People puts people off thinking that there's an option that it's in any way attainable or affordable. And, um, you know, pop promos notoriously were always no budget um, projects and I'm sure you know Mike can attest still to people coming through the door saying I need to borrow a, an SR2 for a, for a shoot for a week and I don't want to give you any money for it and typically they'll knock on our door and say we've only got 750 pounds for it but you know amazingly 750 pounds will buy you you know three or four rolls of super 16 processing and scanning and that's 45 minutes worth of material so that's a 10 to 1 shooting ratio for a, for a promo and you know what mm. that can be enough um, you know, the one that is the puzzle is Super 8. Super 8 is, you know, Super 8 is so proportionally so expensive. And, um, you know, I think sometimes we have conversations with people and they're sort of frustrated. It's like, how can Super 8 be so expensive? Um, and they don't realise, you know, and it's quite often useful when people come into the lab and they see what we do and how we do it. Super 8 for us goes through the same processor that processes 35 and Super 16 film. You know, it's a 2,000 foot bath length, bath length industrial processor that's processing the biggest feature films in the world. And someone's 50 foot cartridge of Super 8 can go through that as well. Um, we have to be really careful with the amount that we run through the bath at any time. So it can't run continuously like we can with 35 or 16. So typically we'll put only 400 foot lengths of Super 8 through the bath, which means it actually has quite an operational overhead in terms of the time for starting up, running and shutting down on Super 8, which is, you know, it all contributes to why the, why the costs are relatively high for it. But, you know, the only thing that, the bizarrely, the only thing that's really more expensive per, per minute from Super 8 is 65 mil. And, um, and we love 65 mil, obviously, because that is yeah. probably reassuringly expensive, so. Well, interestingly, um, you mentioned there, Adrian, about people coming in to take two and asking, Mike, for um, you know, with these lower budget things. I mean, what what more can be done to encourage people to to 
take the film seriously and, and take on these projects. Could I answer that, Adrian? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, so um, actually between us, I don't know what, about a year now, we've, we've been getting people in exactly under that guise, showing them the, well, opening up the door so that they can see what actually it is to shoot on film. Um, and then do half a day with us and then go down uh, to CineLab and then do the tour of CineLab and make all the connections and actually see, you know, start to finish and what they need to know. So it's not this big, scary thing. Um, and we've done a, quite a lot of those, I would say, uh, to try and, well, keep film going, I suppose. Um, but also a lot of these young budding DOPs that are in all these production companies and everything else, they've gone through the digital route and you know it is what it is but film does have a certain look so depending on your you know if you're shooting a, a pop video or a, a hippie festival or something and you'd shoot a bolex you know square you know what i mean with light flickering in and because that's actually the look you're after so it's also opening up their palette to depending on the job to choose the right format um whether it be digital or it be um you know or it be film so yeah i've I've really enjoyed doing that, and we have done an awful lot of them, uh, which, I mean, hopefully we'll continue in the future, uh, the, you know, showing the world what there is. It's not perfect for every job, but it definitely has a place and has a role and has a look, and a lot of people now coming through don't realise that or, or have experienced it. So, um, you know, one, want to uh, and get it under their belt, and two, if it's the right thing for the right job, pick it and which puts them above i suppose somebody else who's only ever had digital you know when it comes to touting for a job or you know or building your your, your portfolio up mm. i think yeah. there, there's a interesting attraction as well with film uh now because i mean what if i go back to when i started and um uh, you know like phil i mean I, at college i used to um, process my own 16 mil in baths you know they showed us how to you know uh, <clears throat> process it all and then project it and everything the, the whole thing about film is how tactile it is as opposed to to uh, you know digital and so I think it's a kind of a novelty I mean you can handle film you can smell it touch it you can hear it going through the gate and there's nothing better than you know film going through the gate for concentrating the mind on how much money is going through the camera at the time. And that does bring its own form of, you know, um, focus and concentration on what you're shooting and planning, you know, so you can shoot a very good, um, you know, production with a very small ratio, if, uh, a film ratio, if, you, if you're really well planned. Um, and that's the, you know, Again, the sort of um, the difference that I think uh, you know a lot of new filmmakers actually quite quite like after working with digital, where a lot of the time it can be quite throwaway. Um, and I know a lot of cin cinematographers I've worked with have shot a lot of stuff, and I've operated a lot of stuff that I've really disliked and not. Real and, and felt that it's it's not up to my normal standard or you know but they, they've as we used to say shot under protest um you know and i think with film where you're limited to how much you can shoot because it's costing money every time you put film through the gate that you know it puts a pressure on you to plan and think and to um you know make that um you know uh, make it count you know, every time you turn the camera over. That's even the actors. That's everybody. That's the whole set, not just... Well, the actors just... love it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the actors are talked to. The fact that you do cut a shot and then there's a, a, a period where, you know, there might be a discussion with the director before they go again, instead of just being told to go again and again. I've had so many actors say to me, why are we going again? Because I'm... As the operator, I'm the only one that's next to the actor because everybody else is in a black tent behind. And I, I, I just have to say, I don't know. I don't know why we're going again. They have, you know, this, um, 
uh, you know, find that that is just such a wasteful thing and tiring as well, you know, because if you keep doing that through the course of a, you know, I don't know, a 12 hour day, your actors are just exhausted by the end and the performances, you can see them dying in front of the camera because you're shooting too much. Um, so, you know, I think I think actors like the discipline of, of film. I mean, there are certain times where I think, you know, obviously the choice of medium should be digital. I mean, if the actors, you know, uh, want a lot of improvisational kind of stuff that, you know, some directors do like to work, um, you know, um, in the moment and not so planned. And, you know, maybe digital is the most appropriate you know, um, medium in that sense for it. But, I mean, you still have to have a certain amount of planning even then, um, you know, to get good material. I think there's a lot more, you know, sort of mediocre material shot because of the almost throwaway nature of, you know, um, shooting on digital. I mean, it doesn't always have to be like that, but I see that quite often. Yeah, I think there's a there's a cine, cinematographically there's a there you know with a high ASA you know an 800 ASA camera or 1600 ASA camera the you know there's there's very rarely uh, no exposure available to you so mm -hmm. so you know what you have to do I guess is to make choices about how you're going to influence what exposure there is and one of the choices that you can make is to not influence the the you know the the light scenario that you have um uh, and then various degrees you know of extreme extremity of 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 um of uh, of control control freakishness amongst us um and um and and i guess that's that's the the worry the homogeneity of a lot of uh, digital acquisition mediums means that the work becomes homogeneous. And I, mean, I know I like my first film was shot on 16 millimeter. It was a two four O crop center crop um, from a super 16 negative. Um, we shot the whole film on 500 T because um, I could, we could only afford 48 rolls of film for the, for the whole movie. And if mm. I'd have had two, if I'd have had two stocks, I might have ended up with, like some like some some you know 200t that i couldn't use for the night scenes or whatever so so i shot the whole film 500t um and uh, from those like logistical pragmatic decision making standpoint created a kind of uh, uh a textured feel to the to the movie that 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 without that without that extra assistance i probably wouldn't be a cinematographer today because that film was the thing that then led to the next film and the thing that led to the next film and so you know uh, it's our duty to use every form of you know image capture to 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 tell that story and like like uh, like like Pete was, Pete was saying you know sometimes it is improvisational and storytelling sometimes you have to follow uh, uh, an actor when they just wander around the set and you know and doing that in a in a film scenario leads to disappointment in uh, you know um but but likewise um uh being emotional and trying to cry for for, for 14 hours because you don't need to reload is is hardcore for the actors so you know it, it's great that we have all these choices mm. it, it, it's interesting chris that you mentioned the 500t and um you know one of the frustrations we have is sort of 500 t's become the swiss army knife of, of film stocks it's the one that you know requires the least amount of light it's it's the fastest so people just go oh yeah just give us a load of 500 t and i'll shoot with it right. and you know one of the other aspects of it is the fact that you know if it's you know a lot of the time it ends up being quite grainy as, yeah. as a result and you know for the lower end productions you know some of the promos and, and commercials guys they want it to look like film and it's the thing that rubber stamps it and goes look I've shot 500 feet it's super great and it looks really 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 like yeah. film and that's what I want people to, to make sure they see and there's also this current trend for you know doing full frame scans that you're seeing the edge of frame you're seeing the perforations 
yeah, you know, the sprocket sprocket holes within within view, particularly on Super 8 as well, which is all sort of quite nice. You know, you look at Super 8, you know, I've got a Super 8 background around me. I defy anybody to look at Super 8 and not have a warm feeling and, and smile when they see it. But, you know, if you've got really bright, you know, sunny days and you're shooting with 50D on 16 mil, you know, on a Bolex, it can look super, super sharp and incredibly, uh, you know, the texture within it is, is really, really beautiful. And there's very, very little evidence of grain if you've got well-exposed 50D stock. And I think that's one of the things that's frustrating is people aren't aware of the range of differences because almost film that they're seeing, all the film that they're seeing at the moment is 500T. And um, I mean, it, it's an interesting one. Mike, Mike and I, you know, since the BSC show in January, we've been talking about doing this sort of comprehensive test of all of the film stocks, which basically will, you know, we'll shoot all the four color film stocks, shoot some black and white as well, across 16, 35, two perf, three perf and four perf, basically to demonstrate to people the difference, you know, also inside and outside with the different film stocks with the different formats, but also downstream of that, showing it alongside all of the different range of scanners, because we've got a massive range of scanners and every time, you know, there's very few people that fully understand the nuances of why we've got different scanners and why they're so different. But we're hoping now as, as lockdowns lifted, but before we get too busy again, we're hoping to do this comprehensive um, of shoot you know of, of all of those formats for a comparison because I don't I genuinely don't think it's ever been done on that scale we've seen lots and lots of of pockets that have been focused around a particular thing and a lot of the ones recently were really around comparing them to digital cameras and um and really what this is about is trying to explain to people what the difference is between those film stocks and it's interesting that you shot Super 16 and Letterboxd 240 you know, you're using a tiny, tiny image to end up with that, yeah, yeah. but it still stands up. You could still put it on the big screen. And, um, and you know, a lot, an awful lot of people wouldn't question it in terms of resolution. If you use a 1.3 anamorphic lens on Super 16, it looks absolutely stunningly beautiful and looks really, you know, those, those Hawk 1.3 lenses are really, really quite, quite tremendous. And when, whenever we see them coming in, it's always interesting to look at the rushes just to see, you know, just to see how lovely those pictures look. Mm. Well, if you if you can resurrect a roll of Fuji 400T low con, count yeah. count me in. Like I, that was my favourite stock. I loved it. Yeah. And, and then Agfa, I once shot a short film on Agfa 320 that was a that was already a decade out of date in in 2002. Um, if I could, yeah, I'd love to get my hands on some of that. So they they shot six. Sex lies oh. and videotape on that. It was, yeah. Oh, oh up mm. until probably up until, I mean, still it happens, still it happens now. People will come in with Fuji stock. Fuji, I think, stopped manufacturing in 2012. Um, so, you know, anything that's still in circulation is at least eight years old. Yeah. Um, one of the problems we have with it, you know, so basically as film gets old, if it's not been looked after, it goes, you know, the sensitivity goes on it, so it becomes particularly grainy. Funnily enough, that's not something an awful lot of people are bothered about. If they want to shoot on yeah. film and want people to know that they're shooting on film. Um, you know, we were talking before we went live about the black and white aspect of it. And, you know, shooting Fuji colour that's gone quite grainy actually works quite well when it's desaturated to black and white. It doesn't have the same contrast, but it has a really, really very, very strong grainy texture to it, which um, which is a cheap way of people being able to shoot shoot for black and white as such. But one of the challenges we've had most recently with Fuji stocks is the backing's not coming off um, when we actually process. So in the last year, we've sort of said to people, look, if you're gonna shoot some Fuji because you've got a stack of it, please send us some in first of all, let us do some clip tests on it. If the backing's not coming off it, we're not gonna process it, really, really sorry. I think Kodak a while ago basically stopped processing Fuji, they just said, blanket we're not going to process yeah, yeah. stock so don't send it to us send it to cine lab um yeah. you know it, it, up until probably a year and a half two years ago it wasn't so much of a problem but unfortunately it's become become more so of a problem recently so i, I remember shooting on it was like an agfa like a sound dupe stock yeah it had no mid-tones and it looked like mercury when it came out a lot super, of car commercials used it super mm. black super yeah. contrasty yeah. yeah, like the the 16 ASA. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
So yeah. there was also a stock that was it Kodak brought out and it was called Prime Time and it was for multi camera TV shooting. So it was a very sort of um, flat, um, uncontrasty. Low contrast, yeah. 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 Um, and I remember. ASA. Yeah. I remember shooting a, a pop, not me, I was operating, but the DOP shot a pop promo on, on that. And it looked stunning in that context, you know. He obviously knew his stuff about how it was going to respond, but it was actually, you know, meant for multi camera studio, uh, TV studio shooting. But then they just discontinued it out of the blue. But so, you know, so the, so the challenge was if you, you know, if you looked at the, the, the technical aspects of it, films always had this massively wide dynamic range, much, much bigger than TV was ever able to cope with. So the whole point about the skill of the telecine operator back in the day, and I'm, you know, I'm talking back in sort of the 80s for this, was how do you take something that's got this, you know, this massive wide dynamic range and cram it into a 40 to 1 contrast ratio CRT TV set? And that's where all the skill was. So actually the stocks that you were talking about Mm -hmm. you know, were deliberately designed to reduce that, to make it easier to put it through the TV process, because otherwise so much of it was lost. Get and, lost yeah. and what's, you know, what's encouraging now is with what we're gaining with 4K and HDR and what's happening with the digital cinema projections without, you know, with laser projectors and everything, is they're, you know, they're finally able to reproduce what film captured in the first place. And, um, you know, we worked on a, an archive project for, Pink Floyd that was released just before Christmas and it was a concert shot in 1988. Um, it seems like they took 10 cinematographers for that. I don't know whether, Phil, you didn't work on a Pink Floyd concert in 88, did you? No. no. <laughs> so it was delicate sound of thunder. Was shot over Floyd, on my own, I shot the Pink Floyd, but not with a group. So. It, it was shot over three nights with 10 cameras. It looked like they just got all of the stock they could get from anyone. So there's a mixture of Agfa and Fuji and Kodak. It yeah. went out. It was only ever transferred to one inch videotape. That's what it was edited and mastered on. It was released on, on VHS and there was a DVD, but it all came from that composite standard best video. Um, that was remastered in 4K last year. You know, it was two years in terms of re-editing. We scanned everything, telecined everything, did 4K and 6K select tape scans for the end of it. It was remastered in 4K HDR on the big screen. And this was shot over 30 years ago and looks as good as anything that could be shot today. Mm. And, you know, that's one of the other testaments of film. And, you know, forget shooting it today with what film stocks have progressed, you know, with Vision 3 particularly. But I, don't, I don't know if you remember when they re refurbished the Hackney Empire, they decided to have a, a, a show to, to uh, thank all the people that put money in to help refurbish it. And the opening of the show was a newsreel that was shot a hundred years previously um, at the Boer War, I think it was, and that they opened the show with this footage. And I ask now, you know, anything shot digitally in a hundred years from now, are we going to be able to see it? Is it going to be still living? Um, it's quite interesting that the, the film just sits and sits. And I mean, I think 70 years is the average life of uh, black and white negative, but I could be wrong there. But uh, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, and you can keep, migrating that to something else but digitally it's a bit of a worry i think in terms of uh, archiving i, I mean, saw a rather good um, documentary on apollo 11 uh it was on netflix and they've rescanned a load of old film from that and it's fantastic did you see that the, the rescan was, was I have seen it, no. fantastic mm. stuff and you can see it's like, it's like they shot it today but of course all the outfits oh, yeah. you can see all the, everyone's got their little film cameras out to film the launch and all that kind of stuff it's yeah glorious. Um, we've got a question here from Mark James. Um, Hi, I'm a student DP and I have a tremendously helpful service from Take-Two and Scene Lab. I'm looking to shoot a project on 35mm double X working with Take-Two and Scene Lab. The opportunity is incredibly exciting and a worthy discipline practice within learning the craft for the entire crew. What advice would you give young filmmakers looking to shoot on film, especially with current digital capture being generally cheaper and flexible for younger filmmakers? Um, any mic? Um, in what way to, to keep the cost down? That that sort of answer, or in yeah, how to do it? I think possibly. Um, um, yeah. Well, maybe if Mark's still watching, he can clarify that. But yeah, I mean, th there there are ways to. I mean, obviously, uh, we talked about a lot of them 
about getting, you know, rehearsing the scenes and doing it, you know, doing it in as fewer takes as possible. Um, but you can shoot two per, three per, um, and four per, and, you know, and they, if you're shooting anamorphic, you want the taller legs and maybe four per. But if you are going to shoot letterbox spherical and you shoot uh, the two per, then, you know, everything uh, halves in cost. So if you shoot uh, 16 mil, the cost is four times less than 35 or thereabouts. Um, if you shoot two per 35, it's only twice as expensive as 16 mil as such, but you still got that beautiful wide screen with an awful lot of detail in it. Um, so there are all sorts of you know, ways that can, can help there. And people forget the, the data and the processing of the data that goes you know, through with these new big cameras that are 8Ks you know, and 6K cameras. There's an awful lot that goes through. An awful lot of money gets spent on hard drives and copying, and then a lot of time wasted just uploading all of that. So if you do it right and you choose your medium, you can make it for you know, a, 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 not a, a huge amount of money, and you will get a very different look. Um, something we haven't touched upon is um, what I hear a lot is oh, everything just looks the same these days. You know, people come in and go, yeah, it's just, have you got anything different? Have you got anything that you knew that no one else has had that I can stick in front of a digital camera. You know, large format has sort of gone down that avenue of look and more depth of field and, you know, just more epic and that sort of thing. But in, in the old days on film, you had the different stocks, which, you know, now there aren't so much just Kodak, but, you know, there are different stocks in Kodak in one range, um, which give you slightly differences. They were, there were the filters, there were the lenses, and then there was the way you lit it. And you put the combination together and everyone can do something different, something niche something something fresh. Whereas I think nowadays, uh, you know, it's all gonna look the same. So I would, I would, if you can, and you can work it out and it's the right sort of job, if you can shoot it on film, you will, you will get something that's different, that stands out from the crowd a little. Um, and I think that's worth considering, especially as a young, uh, you know, as a young DP trying to make his way and be different from everyone else. Hmm. I think that what's interesting is that um, speaking of Ariflex and Panavision is there must be a lot of film cameras sitting on the shelf. And uh, it would seem to me that uh, I'm sure you could get a decent deal from either uh, those big companies, excuse me, uh, Mike, for walking over take two. But I mean, you know, Panavision, I remember I was doing my first digital film with, and we were talking about it a lot and uh, uh, I was in Los Angeles with Bob Harvey at Panavision, and we were talking about whether this film should be done digitally or on film. And I, we couldn't make up our minds because it, uh, of various aspects, which I won't go into in terms of what's it going to be in front of the camera. But I remember Bob Harvey, and I said to Bob, well, you know, I'm not sure whether we'll go digital at all. He said, don't worry, i got 200 film cameras sitting on the shelf here. You can have any one you want. And I think if you do shoot film, there's probably going to be a lot of equipment you can choose from, um, I would say. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there is. And the, the other thing to remember there is that to shoot digital, uh, I mean, I'll just go on to Video Village now. Uh, I would say three to four transmitter, uh, three to four receivers per transmitter. So that's three or four monitors per camera, uh, two cameras, you know what I mean? Uh, we want lens control, we want everything. We want wireless this, wireless that. There's all these toys of Ronin's. What, so, and when you use all that to do your digital production, it's actually a, a lot of gear. But if you go back to film, you don't, the, the video picture, there are some HD taps out there, but most of them are not. Most of them are analog still. Um, so, you know, all this wireless sending and everything else, you, you're sending not a great picture uh, and people, the best way to look at it is, is through the camera and through the eyepiece. And, you know, the operator can see exactly what, what is going on. Well, that's something you I want to mention. You don't need but it all. Something yeah, I wanted to mention, Mike, was actually if you do shoot on film, you have to look through the viewfinder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, digitally, there's so many different ways of looking, apart from Peter Robertson's job. But, uh, uh, you know, if you shot on film, you had to work with the viewfinder. And the thing mm -hmm. I found most difficult about digital was that the viewfinder wasn't very good and everyone was looking at the monitor, and I just don't know how you can really operate a film properly uh, using a monitor, um, because you have to feel the camera alongside you, it seems to me, and you have to, so you can move it with 
people's movement rather than just looking at a, a little monitor that's stuck to the side of it. But that's just well, that, actually, Phil. I mean, I think you know we've we've been you know singing the praises of film, but that is one thing for me as an operator having a decent picture, a, a full digital picture to work mean? from from a monitor is you know crappy video assists that you know I'm glad they they disappeared. I mean, but you have to go. You know, that's what you'll get if you kind of go back to film. But as you say. Uh, you know, if you're if you're working with Steadicam, you know, obviously a digital picture onto your screen is so much better than the old video assists. And also, if you're operating off monitors from cranes or what have you, you know, you're using a video tap. You know, people don't realize that you know you're not getting all the light that's going into the camera, so you're getting a pretty dim picture. Mm. Um, you know, and if you've got low light scenes. Yeah, um, not- which nine times out of ten they are, um, you know, you're not getting a great picture to the operator. So digital monitors are just a huge improvement for operating. But having said that, I mean, I prefer, because of my background, operating through an eyepiece. Mm. Um, and the only reason I don't on digital is for exactly what you said. You're looking at a tiny TV monitor where the um, full uh, digital information is not really being fed. So you've got a, uh, a kind of a downgraded image that you're looking at through an eyepiece, where with a film camera, you're looking optically through the lens. Yeah. You know? and, and the good thing about, for me, for operating on film was that you could seal yourself off from everything around you. It's so much easier to concentrate down an eyepiece now with digital, if I'm looking at a monitor and it's on the camera, which is very useful if you're doing action work and stunts because you have a kind of a peripheral watch across the, the whole set, you can see when someone's going to enter frame and leave. Um, you know, you've got that option. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, the thing is with, um, with, with film cameras is that, uh, sorry, when you were using that monitor on a, a digital camera, on set, you'll have people walking around, even while you're shooting sometimes. It's really distracting. Um, and using an eyepiece, um, you know, when they said turn over, you were in that little world in the, in, in the viewfinder, and you really felt as though you were watching cinema. Mm. Because it's, it's dark in there. The, the yeah. quality is really amazing. Mm. You could even actually you know, um, as, as Lee will attest, you know, the operator even used to help with the focus yeah. because, yeah. Yeah. you know, a, an eyepiece, uh, a film optical eyepiece is quality enough to be able to tell focus, especially on anamorphic. I remember um, one director who was a, an ex-cameraman uh, working uh, as a director made me actually look at the squeeze all the time on an anamorphic film um, so that I could actually tell focus because we were using lots of long lenses. And, um, you know, he said, you've got to give the focus puller a a help. And I just learned to operate a widescreen, but with the the squeeze on. Um, And- Squeeze off, do you mean? Sorry, squeeze off, yeah, yeah. Um, But you had the option there, you could flick between the two, you know? So um, yeah, the operator could actually make an, an assessment on focus, which on digital, I, I quite often just turn the focus pull and shrug my shoulders, yeah. you know? Um, <laughs> Lee's laughing, <laughs> been through it so many yeah, times. Yeah. <laughs> At least we've got a big monitor now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So those sort of things for young filmmakers are different ways of working, you know, getting used to an eyepiece. Because the other thing is, as Phil said, you know, you can't take your, your eye off the eyepiece. It has to stay on. Otherwise, you get the leak down the, the, uh, the, the, the le- you know, into, um, down the viewfinder. So um, crawling over a dolly, using a geared head or even just a fluid head, going low to high on a jib and then crawling and panning around the dolly is a skill that you need to to learn, you know, because you physically have to be attached to the camera while you do that, you know. I do remember starting out on film, 
just being on a fuller focus all the time. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Handheld as well. Yeah, yeah. With a, yeah. Just There'd be two of you dodging around together, you know, your hand on the, the, the lens. So, so that, that, is, that is another thing. I talk to a lot of the young uh, guys when they come in. Uh, focus pulling done digitally is done, in my head, after the fact. Because there's a delay in all ways, so there's a delay from the processing going on on the chip, then sending it to the wireless sender, then there's a delay in the sender, then the video monitor that you're pulling focus on, and then the communication via the lens control system back to the camera. So there's this delay. So when you do digital focus pulling, you're looking at a screen, and as someone moves, and as you're probably in a tent, as we talked about earlier, and you can't see they're about to move, you catch them. Whereas, you know, in the older days when they had a tape measure out and everything else, you've, the operator's down the, down the camera and the focus puller's physically looking at the subject going, right, they're free, they're, oh, they're going to step. And they're catching them as they go. So there's a very different look between I mean, we a still focus find puller who can do it on a tape measure and know that someone is six foot two inches away just by knowing it, rather mm -hmm. than actually having to see him shot. I mean, I still try and keep to that old way where my monitors just... I know you do. And so I'm looking as well as just having a quick look down when they've stopped checking on there. Which is a great I mean, it's, skill. It's helpful to monitor. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I think a lot of the new people do not have that... Yeah, yeah. You know, the people coming through do not have that mindset and cannot do that. Um, and, and that is a, a really good skill. It makes you a better focus puller if you come through that way as well. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Well, when it's when you see on the monitor, it's out of focus. It's out of focus. You, you know you, that that's for real. Whereas if you're measuring and you're looking at the actor, you can anticipate. Yeah. You know if they're short of their mark or they're over their mark. Yeah. You know. Um, whereas if you're looking at a monitor, how do you see where the artist's feet are? You know, you, all you know is when suddenly they're not on their mark and they're soft on the screen. Yeah. You know, so that's going down on, on the film. Yep. No, it's, it's a huge difference, huge difference. And it's the one thing that, you know, young 20-year-olds that come in to shoot on film have to get their head around. They have to, they have to understand that, you know, you are not... The video assist, as you said, it, it's not that it's an SD picture. It's that the dynamic range of that little camera is five, six stops, and the film stop might have 16 stops. So when you think, you know, you can't... if you use the film as you want it with the full range, you pan the, pan the camera around, it just goes white, <laughs> or it goes black on the video assist. So you have to be able to focus full by eye or by tape measure or by working out the moves before the shot, which again leads to that whole thing of everybody knowing their job and seeing how it's gonna work. So if, if someone's gonna do some funny walk on, on the set, that's gonna be very complicated for someone to pull focus through, they would have figured that out beforehand, but digitally it just happens. Then you go, oh, I missed that. Um, yeah. It is very different. But there's one one thing that does help, and that's rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't get off the Without time. recording the rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. It's not a rehearsal then. Yeah, everyone, <laughs> yeah. Being, given, everyone being given the, the amount of time to, um, to do their individual job. Do you, do you think perhaps that's a little bit lost now? Yeah, definitely. Um, Great, we sorted that one out. So um, we've got uh, one more, <laughs> got a couple more questions, and we're just running out of time. So I'm just going to bang this off. Uh, Trevor Coop, hi Trevor. Uh, probably a quick question for Phil. Uh, I entered the business when the DP used the brute to fill uh, as a fill light for exteriors. If you come across a producer who has only worked on digital, how do you convince them that you need a truck full of 10Ks instead of a small, uh, a couple of small Kino flows and a three-head dado kit that they think is a huge kit? Uh, Phil, any ideas on that one? How, how do you... How do you convince them? Um, uh, you don't convince them, you tell them this is how you're going to do it. Um, <laughs> the thing is, they, I mean, yes, that's a bit of a joke, but the thing is that, you know, the actors have got to look good. You want to record their performance. The whole of the success of the drama of the piece you're working on is the performance of the actor. The actor's eyes are everything. And therefore, you have to have equipment with you in order to capture the eyes. Now, what you find with digital, I found anyway, is it's much more forgiving in terms of the top and the bottom. So outdoors now, and when it, the three-strip Technicolor was 12 ASA. 
And if you weren't in the sunlight, it was black. Your face was black. You had to have a brute on it in order to light the face up to match the sunlight. Uh, nowadays, you can shoot digitally. I found personally that you can shoot with almost any light and you don't necessarily need as much fill light. But the thing is, if you're trying to achieve a look or a feeling, and obviously you need what I always say to people is that when you go out, when you arrive on the set, you've got to leave the set having got everything that's required that day. Whatever the weather is, whatever happens, whether the actress has been up all night uh, worrying about something, and therefore her eyes are all puffed up or whatever it is, whatever's going on, you have to then finish the day having got all of the footage you want and everything you need. So the truck, if you want to call it that, I mean, there's it, it, one... DP famously said, I'm going to shoot this available light. Well, what does that mean? Every lamp that's available on the truck. Um, <laughs> that is an old gag in the film business. But the thing is that you need to have with you enough equipment that you can get over uh, a loss of light. Or, I mean, I've shot, I'm sure all of you, uh, well, those of you that shoot, uh, I've had to shoot a whole sequence of a film at night, making it look like it was still day because we ran out of time. And I'm having to light, more and more light has to come off the truck in order to keep the light going. Well, if you haven't got it on the truck, you can't do that. But at the end of the day, they, you, you, everyone can turn around and say, well, we got that scene finished. And it doesn't look as if it's uh, nighttime shot as day. So you have to have this equipment with you, I think. And that's the argument I would always use, is that you may not use it on Tuesday, but you may need it on Wednesday and so on and so on. And sometimes when you're on location, you know, you can't send for something and say, oh, as you know, Freddie Young famously picked up a 450 mil lens that was sitting on a cupboard at Panavision in Los Angeles. And he said, what's that? And they said, well, it's a, an old lens we made for something. He said, no one's used it. He said, oh, that might come in handy. And that's the dot that showed Omar Sharif coming through the Mirage. It was that's a 50 mil lens. It had no focus marks on it. They had to go out and put focus marks on it. You know, and so you never know. And he said, I'm in the desert for nine months. How do I know what I'm going to need? I better have what I think I might need behind me. Same with lights, same with camera equipment, lenses, everything. You need to know you can keep shooting and deliver the goods. Yeah, I mean, that's what you and, do. I know. You can't turn around and say, I'm sorry, I can, I haven't got enough light for this scene. Sorry. Yeah. When you're can't. prepping your gear, you just got to make sure you've got everything that accommodates whatever yeah. you're throwing at you. Uh, yeah, and you shouldn't overdo it because obviously there's a cost involved. You've got to be, you know, precise. And uh, maybe I've been lucky, but my all the films I've done, no one's really ever argued about. Well, I tell, you, I tell a lie, actually. On GoldenEye, which was 35 mil anamorphic, uh, one of the producers argued about the lighting bill I had for a particular scene. Well, this particular scene was a shot of Pierce Brosnan walking through a group of people watching a busker at night, busker playing uh, a, a mime, comes up a row of steps. We look over his shoulder and we see the whole of Monaco Harbour, including a aircraft carrier, which is carrying a helicopter, which is very important for the next scene. And you have to see that A, it's water, B, it's Monaco Harbour and everything else. And he argued with me about the cost of lighting it. And I said, well, what do you want to see? Do you not want to see the harbour? Or do you want to see the harbour? And we came to a compromise. And to this day, I regret compromising because I look at that shot now and I know it could have been a lot better had he left me alone and let me get on with it. You know, Chris, you needed, needed just one more dado kit. <laughs> <laughs> just one like more. That's it all I needed. Five, yeah. It was five, four Wendy lights was, was yeah. the basics of it. Um, but I had to kill because I he wanted me to get a hundred thousand out of the budget on that shot, and I had to kill all of the esplanade. So what you see, you don't see any of the buildings facing the water. You see all the boats and all the water and the helicopter and the aircraft carrier, but you don't see the esplanade. And I thought that was a mistake. I thought that was sad, being as it was a Bond film. There you go, Chris. But, but I think, you know, like, you know, 800 ASA on a camera is, 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 you know, is a useful thing for shooting live in a in a urban environment and, you know, needing to utilise streetlights that exist, you know. But, but if you're applying light to a scene, you know, through windows, you know, the minute you turn on, you know, a, a 6K and aim it through a window, you're, you're instantly into a key light 
place of uh, where you know where you can use you know 200t or 400t 500t so it's like the numbers it's just like it's just maths and and really the any of the any of the formats kind of work you know if you're if you're relying on 2500 asa as your like as your linchpin asa then then you're not probably doing any lighting of any kind and you should you know question yourself kind of thing um but i don't think i don't think there's a real difference between either a film format of 500t and a digital format at 800 asa there's you know the, it's it's semantics you know if you're going to manipulate the environment and manipulate the atmosphere of the scene you're going to get to you know 500 asa dead quick just at one four lee sorry <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think um, if anyone can answer this in thirty seconds, great. Right? Uh, how do you think shooting film, shooting on film, will look like in ten to fifteen years, uh, ten to twenty years, even? <laughs> no. Will we still be shooting? Film? Is this film here to stay? I want to know. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that in a, on a flippant way. There might be an HD tap by then. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! What <laughs> HD? I think how big um, will it be? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I mean, it all depends. I mean, if you shoot on film, it, you need the entire, <clears throat> entire show. You need the manufacturer of the film. Uh, you need the lenses and you need the development and the processing. Um, if you've got all those three things, it should stay the same. But of course, as we know, through time, things vary. Um, the closure of, the, of wet labs was so sudden and uh, sharp, was quite a shock to us all. That um, that in Los Angeles, in in America now, I think there's only well, there's two labs left actually. There's only one in Los Angeles that seems to do almost everything now, and uh, and there was one left in New York, but before that, every major city had it had a sort of lab. You go to Australia, they had labs. You go anywhere you went, there was a film lab. You go to Bangkok, there was a film lab. You go to Germany, there was a film lab, and now in Italy there was a film lab, and all that's now gone and. Um, I think I, this is this is a difficult one to confess to, but I, I, and I'm I'm not sure whether I should be saying this publicly, but um, we didn't think that we'd be processing film in 2020. You know, our, our business oh, plan no. in 20, yeah. 2013 yeah. wasn't naive enough to think that film was going to be bigger than it had been in the seven year period in in 2019 and 2020. I think you're right. It's the whole ecosystem that's really important for film, and that's where the vulnerability is. It requires it requires the stock to be made. It requires the cameras to be maintained. Now, yeah. the good thing about that aspect of it, and Mike can attest to that bit, is you know the mechanical devices that are eminently serviceable. Whereas an Alexa in five years' time or ten years' time will be really, really difficult to, well, to, to be able to do anything with. Um, in terms of the processing side of it. You know, there's an awful lot of legacy equipment that we use, but the actual main process that we that we run, we installed in 2014. You know, and it, in, if you looked at most labs, their processes would be 20 or 30 years old, and they'd still comfortably be using them. And that was the case when I was in, you know, with with Deluxe and Ascent and Technicolor. Um, so I don't have any doubt that we've got a kit that's serviceable to maintain the business for another 10 or 20 years. Um, and it's not beyond the wit of man to be able to remake a film processor. You know, this is a hundred year old technology that's that in, in essence is, is very much the same process as it was a hundred years ago. Some of the chemicals have changed. Well, and it's 120 years old, actually. <laughs> absolutely. But it's the reliability that's the bit that's important around any of these big productions. But if it's mechanical, the, it can usually be repaired. If it's electronic, yeah. you know, yeah. When a man comes to service my boiler and he says, oh, well, your printed circuit's gone, isn't it? You know, there's nothing I can do. I have to go and buy a new printed circuit. He can't fix it. Uh, and that's just going to be the same with digital cameras. I think. That was the nice thing about film cameras. You could attempt to try and repair it. Oh, yeah. On set. Speaking and of film cameras, you know the film cameras on them? Yeah, well, years ago, there were guys that went out with big productions. I've just been writing the biography of uh, Ted Warringham. I don't know if any of you guys know him, but 
uh, you know, he was uh, he went out on films like The Fall of the Roman Empire, King of Kings. Uh, you know, King of Kings was Super Technirama, which is side film going sideways, and uh, uh, Fall of the Roman Empire was sixty five millimeter, and he serviced all this equipment on a daily basis and kept it going. Uh, but digitally, we're all sunk. If it goes, it we're all sunk. What do we do? Oh, it's not working. Oh, hit it. Oh, doo -doo. you know, um, that's the tragedy, I think, of, of digital technology now is that it's it can blow up and catch fire at the drop of a hat. The real, I think the real. there was a lot of myths, wasn't there, when digital came in, that it was going to be cheaper, more ergonomic uh, to work with and you know, the crews were going to be uh, smaller. And the person I want to get hold of is the person who said that the cameras were going to be lighter and yes. the, sy <laughs> the systems the systems were going to be lighter. We let you um, do. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I mean, I just put more on it. You just put more on it, exactly. I mean, the lenses are the same, you know, everything yeah. about it's the, the same that goes on around it. Mm. It's just that central core. And the, uh, the, 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 camera. the bit that goes on to that, and then the bit that goes on to that, and then <laughs> it goes on to that. I, uh, I think I might have to wrap it up there. I'm starting to feel a little bit sorry for digital. I think you know, <laughs> we're bullying it a little I, bit. We, you know. the, the one final thing, for Ed, if you may, forgive me talking about that, is that the Mitchell Corporation uh, built a camera in uh, 1910. We're still using it today. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. Um, still today. No, it's absolutely. Yeah, mechanical, beautiful. Um, is it uh, just worth mentioning as well? Um, thanks, Mike, for kind of setting this up. I know take two behind it. Um, Kodak, by the way, full disclosure, were going to be involved, um, uh, but there were some furloughing issues. Um, and so, yeah, but we've obviously discussed a fair bit of stuff about Kodak. Um, and I think um, film, personally, I think film's here to stay because as we mentioned earlier, you know, I don't know what the split is nowadays, motion picture versus uh, stills, but I can tell you there is a huge, huge um, resurgence of analog shooters, stills uh, out there at the moment. Lots best of way to learn, the best way to learn. My advice to anybody who want to be a cinematographer, start taking stills and start practicing yeah. it yourself. And I reckon Kodak are doing all right out of that stuff as well. And so, yeah. Um, anyway, so thank you everyone for joining us. Go and uh, go and shoot some film uh, if, you, if you get it. If you get it. Cam cameras <laughs> at the ready, gentlemen. Cameras at the ready. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. Chris, no, so you are in oh. Mike, shame on you. I missed the memo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, Lee, look at that. Fantastic. Look at that. Look at that. And that'll still, that camera will still <laughs> take a perfect picture. Still going. Yeah. Right. Thank That's you, everyone. Okay. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Have a good yeah, evening. Good yeah. to see you all. Thank you very Thanks much. Leaving, leaving the meeting now. Here I go. And <laughs> oh no, I can't. I didn't go. But. <laughs>